about your experience of working together with multiple people on the same code. I'd assume there was some discussion, different coding styles, formatting. Did you collaborate on GitHub? Yeah, so um, we, we kind of, so at the beginning, so we have four coders code independently. And then when we look at each other's code at the meeting, we do find people definitely have different styles and um, different approaches probably. So formatting is one thing, but approach they do this. So at the beginning, for example, for our first task to get the life expectancy, I used data frames because I was only just to start um, I was quite novice to R and my colleague used matrix. And then we discussed the, the differences between data frame and the matrix. And then we found actually using matrix make more sense and more efficient and have all those sort of uh, benefit. So we um, kind of consolidate and use matrix at, in for the work, uh, for the uh, work after. And we didn't, collaborate on GitHub and um, we were thinking we did consider this option and um, we did also uh, did some kind of tutorials learn some tutorials uh, for the Git Kraken which is like a client thing uh, installed on desktop to collaborate on GitHub um, but in the end we, we didn't uh, choose it because in the end we just two people working on the same thing and then the, another two people working on the same thing so yeah, so in the end, we didn't try GitHub. Um, but because we have multiple, because we have uh, multiple people working on the same things, we kind of, it's a good time to contrast each other and learn from each other. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think that's a good point. And, and I think GitHub is, a, is, a, is an impressive, impressive functionality. And I'm, I'm, personally, I'm using it more and more and more, and I'm getting more and more into how it works. But there is a barrier and maybe if you have to combine that barrier to learning it with the barrier to um, learning R, it might be overwhelming and, and maybe you, you, you take it one step at a time. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like future or, or something that you aspire to, because especially as you work in a team and almost always you do, that, that has lots of advantages. Yeah. Um, the second point on the chat wasn't so much a question uh, as it was um, like a compliment essentially this has been very interesting and encouraging as a R novice myself thank you um, and I think it, it has no been problem. so um, in terms of the uh, I have maybe the final question if you can answer very quickly and then we can go to the break how was the reception of this when you actually had to disseminate the results and show it to um, other modelers or maybe the SMC directly yeah so so interestingly we only just finished this last week um but i did have a chance to present this um to my colleagues and my at Heta, my team and people are all very impressed and some people told me oh you know r have a steep learning curve and i i learned r i started learning r a few years ago but then i i just gave up and then now after hearing your presentation i feel mm, I should go back and learn R, feel very motivated. So I haven't got a chance to disseminate this work okay. to SMSC or other places, but only just to the other um, members in my group. Perfect, thank you. So uh, thank you very much again. Uh, I think we can conclude the first part. I'll give uh, people about 10 minutes uh, for a break, for, the, for going for a coffee or something. Um, there's a question, there's an extra question for you on the chat. So perhaps if you can have a look and, and answer that uh, later on. And yeah. then I'll pause the recording now and uh, we'll reconvene in about 10 minutes. Thank you. All right. Thank you for, uh, um, for still being there. I think we didn't lose anybody. We're still the same number of participants now. And I've seen while I was getting to get my coffee, uh, there's been some activity in the chat, perhaps. Um, so, um, okay, I think I've already given Philip Cooney um, co-host powers. So I think you can now unmute yourself, Philip, and uh, start sharing your screen. And perhaps we can go into the next presentation. Hi guys, uh, thanks um, Gianluca. Can you guys hear me? Yes, and we can see your screen, perfect. Um, 
So, so you can see my, my first slide, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Perfect. Um, okay, so thanks for the opportunity to present um, this um, piece of work that I've um, done. Um, I just need to point out that the views and opinions expressed are my own. This is my own work. Um, it's not related to Novartis, but obviously they um, are my employer, so I need to clarify that. Um, so I think um, many people who work in HDA or health technology assessment understand, um, particularly if they've done a health technology appraisal in oncology, that um, there is difficulty in um, extrapolating survival curves. So um, I think Farmerish and, and Liz Fenwick did a, a nice presentation there, um, I think last week that I attended and found very useful work where they just described some of the approaches and challenges um, to extrapolating time to event data. So I would um, encourage you to check that out. Um, also, um, one of the things they, they did mention in passing was that um, it's possible to incorporate um, expert opinion. Um, and the person who was saying that did, did mention that you could do it in a Bayesian framework. Um, so I um, will present how this may be um, implemented. Um, but first, the motivation is that, you know, we see many survival curves have different um, assumptions. So we see here that exponential models in constant hazards. Um, Weibull mo models will assume monotonically increasing and decreasing hazards. Gompert's exponentially increasing or decreasing hazards. And uh, log normal and log logistic can initially decrease, increase, then decrease. So we can see that um, the different parametric curves can yield completely different um, results outside of the observation period for the trial. So um, we usually base our extrapolations on um, goodness of fit statistics. However, as we know, they are the goodness of fit to the observed trial data and doesn't, uh, doesn't tell us anything about the um, extrapolated survival or predicted survival outside the um, trial. Also, um, we have external data and the topic of this presentation, clinical opinion. So I'm just going to show um, just my illustration of this toy example, how, you know, different survival curves can, can result in different uh, extrapolations. So, you know, we have exponential with constant hazards, Weibull can increase or decrease, the same with Gompertz. And then for, you know, um, log normal and log logistic, they can have these heavy tails to the distribution. Um, and then interestingly, there's um, generalized gamma, which um, is a model that um, allows for, um, I hope I get this right, um, exponential, Weibull, Gompertz, and I think log logistic is a special case. And then generalized F also allows for um, the ones I've listed, a bit, uh, you know, generalized gamma as well, um, and adds an additional parameter. So um, these models have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm just going to focus on the simple one and two parameter models. Um, actually, this, this slide, I forgot, illustrates that point. Um, so you can see here that the uh, log logistic is actually incorporated as a special case in generalized F as well. So um, I find just from my own experience working in, um, working as a health economist that um, extrapolations using a clinical opinion, um, they, they, they tend to be um, poorly accepted uh, for, for some valid reasons. Um, are elicited possibly in a, in a pretty ad hoc and informal manner. There's usually not that much information to in, accompany the elicitation approach. So, so that's something you know, we need to do better at. Um, also, they're kind of elicited in a very subjective manner. Um, so there's no uh, formal approach. Um, now, th this is a, a possible solution is, is that um, you know, we can incorporate the survival uh, opinion of the expert and the data in a, in a coherent statistical way. And the way we could do that is, is Bayesian survival analysis. Idea would be that the expert's opinion can be directly incorporated into the, along with the trial level analysis. 
Um, so obviously, uh, I just want to make this clear that um, I, I, I didn't come up with this approach. I, I had thought about it before I went to for that year, um, but uh, Dr. Mario Owens, he, he presented on this topic. Um, so I kind of was interested in it uh, because I was already thinking about this topic. And I thought maybe I would just, uh, as my own challenge, just to implement it. Um, so um, just to give a real quick overview of, of what I mean by Bayesian methods, um, and in particular, the context of um, this problem or statistical problem, um, we, we basically want to update my, our prior belief, i.e. the clinician opinion, with data, which is the trial uh, data, and obtain a posterior belief for the survival. Um, the issue with this Bayesian method or, well, um, you know, the difficulty sometimes with Bayesian methods is that um, the probability of the data in this relatively simple formula typically doesn't have an analytic solution. Um, and therefore, we usually use bugs, jazz, JAGs or STAN to, to do our calculations. Of course, I should highlight that um, we can write our own uh, samplers or, and uh, may, maybe that's something I will do to incorporate some of the more complex distributions. Um, and then we can use um, kind of Bayesian goodness of fit measures to see which model fits um, both the data and clinical opinion the best. Um, and yeah, that's in, in brief how I, I propose this could be, could be done. Um, so, very briefly, I'll, I'll mention how we can elicit the opinion. Um, obviously, there, there could be a lot more work that could be done on this, um, you know, to align this to shelf guidelines and do all the proper methodology. But, you know, for this toy example, we could consider the, ask the expert, um, okay, at 10 years, what is the plausible range of survival probabilities for treatment X? Um, the, we would explain to the expert that a plausible range means that the upper and lower survival probabilities um, are such that the expert is 95% sure that the actual survival will be within that range. And then through this um, Bayesian method, we can um, uh, select the parameters of the distribution to cover this, um, sorry, select the parameters of the survival distribution to cover this distribution. Um, and I, in the next slide, I'll I'll show what that means. Um, so I've, I've taken this directly from Mario's um, presentation. So the, the link is in the description or in, in the title here. Um, so basically, you ask the, the clinician at 10 years, what do they think the survival probabilities would be? And they say that they're, you know, 90, you know, they're 95 percent sure that it's between 10 and 15. Um, and then for the simple one parameter model, it's, it's, it's very easy to come up with a prior for the um, hazard. It's just um, this formula here and, uh, for 10% and, and the same formula for 15%. Um, so that's fine for one parameter models, but obviously, which is only the exponential distribution, but we, we all know the exponential distribution might not be appropriate for extrapolation because it assumes constant hazards. So we also, for this method to be any use, would want to do two parameter distributions. So this works with two parameter distributions by basically, um, let's say for the Weibel example, you have um, a, a scale which is denoted by lambda, um, and you have a, a shape which is denoted by, I think in, in Mario's presentation, it, it looks like a little theta symbol. Um, so, so basically, we, we would um, have the shape, we'd set a uniform prior on the shape, we would draw a random value from the shape, and then we would then um, plug that shape value into this equation, which is minus ln 10 divided by 10 to the power of shape, and we would get ourselves a scale, and um, that would be the, the, the value that would ensure that um, it's, it's between 10%. Um, and then, um, so, so, so this is the same thing here. We're, we're just um, sampling the, the shape first, and then we compute the upper and lower bounds for um, survival. Um, and, that's, and, and then from this, we draw our um, scale parameter. So um, I, I know I kind of just ran through that, but uh, just because of the 
purpose of this was more the um the actual or shiny tool I've, I've just mentioned it in passing the analytic method but um i hope to work on it more and um, possibly uh, develop this into a paper at some stage um so uh, i just wanted to show for illustration this is um, a gastric screening data set. The only reason why I've done this is because it's um, available in OR. Um, it's got a few enough patients, so um, it's easy to run the models because you know it, it, it's fast um, for the purpose of illustrations. And um, also, um, just here, I note that I've um, just in this example, I've, I've assumed that the prior belief. Um, for survival is at 75 weeks and is between 25 and 30 percent. Now, obviously, you wouldn't do this in practice because we observed the survival at that time point. But I just wanted to highlight that the meta does give the appropriate coverage of um, probabilities um, at the time point you specify. So, so this isn't really particularly interesting, but it just shows that the method actually works. And we can see here that you know if we if we scale up the if we have a strong prior belief on um, the survival at a particular time, even if there's data there, it, it will kind of overpower that data because you know we have a strong opinion. Um, the same thing you know that's illustrated in in the second plot and and again in the third plot. Um, Again, as you can see, um, as you may not or may not be able to see, but um, when we have wider um, survival probabilities or a weaker prior, um, the survival curve tends to approach the data more than the, the expert or opinion. And um, these green lines here, you know, these, the, these distributions just show the prior belief. And the green lines show um, what would be the kind of um, Kaplan-Meier 95% uh, confidence interval. So, so, so we can see here that in our first illustration, we have very strong prior on our survival probabilities, um, which is kind of in the center between um, where the data is. Um, in the second one, we have a, a situation where we've got an extremely strong prior on the um, a prior belief which is completely against what we expect in the data because the the green line show the 95 percent confidence intervals for the capital meyer curve at 75 weeks and um, so therefore because of this um the the survival the prior basically dominates the exterior and um our, our our predicted survival is very close to the actual um expert opinions. And then we see here for the um, prior where we have uh, um, a kind of a wide range of, of, of values, then the, um, the, 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 the posterior distribution for survival is, is somewhat between the, the actual data and the prior belief. Uh, it should be noted that there's only 32 observations in this data set, so it probably um, will be strongly influenced by the um, prior belief in, in, in any case. If, if you had maybe hundreds of observations, um, the, the prior belief mightn't have a, such a strong impact. So um, because this is uh, uh, or in HTA um, module, I thought it would be probably more useful to um, the shiny tool. Um, we would like obviously to um, be able to, you know, present this to clinicians and trying to explain statistical techniques to clinicians is difficult. Um, not that's not, you know, it's just because some of these things are, are quite far in these concepts. So um, one thing that we could do is is develop a nice, simple user interface, and we could get the user to play around with the survival distributions and see how they look. Uh, or sorry, the prior. Um, belief on survival and then we can see until they're comfortable uh, and then we can run the analysis and then maybe show them um, what the output is and, and then they can say okay well that agrees with what I've seen uh, or what I believe and maybe you can readjust this um, if it's kind of outside what they think um, is plausible. 
So um, I, I will go through the Shiny app in, in, in more detail, but 